So welcome to another podcast experience uh, with the Data Standard. My name is Matthew Rawl, and I'm very, um, very pleased today to introduce Mike Katniss. Mike is a Vice President of Statistical Analytics and Data Science at uh, Equifax. Mike, thank you for, for taking the time to, to join us today. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Fantastic. So before we dive in, Mike, I think it'd be helpful if you could just introduce yourself and give a little background mm -hmm. on kind of where you're working today and kind of maybe a little bit of your career path as well. Sure. Okay. So like Matt said, I work at Equifax, which is one of the big three credit reporting agencies. I've been here about seven years, uh, worked in a variety of roles in the data and analytics organization from everything from data governance to insights generation to now I lead a team that brings together our disparate data sources and links them together to accurately match them to the same consumers uh, so that, you know, when you do a credit report or something, it's, it's accurate. So what my background, I started out as uh, a scientist. I have a physics PhD from the University of Michigan. Uh, I did five years of astrophysics research as a postdoc, uh, realized about uh, five, well, it was five and a half years, about five years in, I realized I was a better data analyst than I was a telescope builder, uh, and left, uh, for the business world. I landed at Capital One, uh, which was a really great landing place for me. I was a data analyst there, started out as a performer, uh, and over 14 years there ended up by the end, leading the biggest team of data analysts in their biggest division their US credit card business. So pretty technical background, but had a lot to learn about the business world. And there was no such thing as a data scientist when I started, and now they're everywhere. So super interesting background. Um, and, I, and that was actually the question I was going to kind of segue into is you've been in this industry for a while now, and you've seen this, this evolution kind mm -hmm. of of a you know, you, you called it a data analyst and today kind of the data scientist is kind of on kind of everyone's minds. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little about kind of the, how that perception has changed, but but also kind of, you know, how the, the tools have changed and how the capabilities have changed in the industry? Sure. Yeah. So I think if I go back, I, I think everybody, anybody who's been involved with an analytic function and maybe even some of the technology functions has been doing some kind of data science since the you know, anytime you were hired into that role, it was just wasn't called that. Mm -hmm. um, and when I started, you know, the kind of analysis we were doing was was simpler. We were working on Oracle or Teradata databases, mostly use SQL. The statisticians were using SAS to build models, but they were a separate function. And uh, I will tell you when the, the term data scientist first started, I was one of the people poo-pooing it. Uh, and so it was a lot of folks. So, I mean, the joke was, at least in Richmond, Virginia, was the, a, do you know what a, a data scientist is? It's a data analyst who lives west of the Mississippi. Um, <laughs> but I also think there was sort of that resistance and some arrogance on my part of being a scientist before. And when data science first started, people really weren't they weren't treating it like a science. They were treating it like they talked about, I remember articles talking about, hey, we'll have to get used to things like not knowing the reasons for things. We'll have to just learn to live with correlations telling us what to do. Thankfully, that perspective died out very quickly because people realized if you don't know why your results are doing what they're doing, you won't know why they will change. And so, you know, what I've seen in the last seven, eight, nine years has been a proliferation of the platform. Like there's been a huge shift in the kind of platforms you're using to do this work. There's been, I think, you know, you're going from traditional databases to then everybody was doing Hadoop. Now everybody's moving to the cloud. They're moving away from traditional database structures to, you know, unstructured databases to graph databases. And, you know, the number of languages that we have to play in is expanded and changed every couple of years. But in my, what I, I actually really like that because it means you can make a difference pretty quickly. I think the expectations of data scientists have grown and that has actually led to sort of a divergence of different types of data scientists. 
in where you have folks that are, you know, you have data scientists that are almost like engineers who are building out machine learning solutions. You have people that come out of the statistician world that now are doing machine learning rather than, you know, logistic regression. You have people in my space, which is more the analytics and the insights development where, you know, you still have to be a data expert, but you have to work with a lot of different types of data that you didn't have to. And now you have to work with a lot of different tools. You have to be someone who could play around with text uh, analytics. You have to learn a little bit about, or a lot, depending on your role, about what are the machine learning techniques that would help you do your job better. What, what about the... Um the dialogue and the interface with the with the line of business how has that changed and because it seems like in in a lot of places the the role of the data science uh, scientist has been kind of elevated and you you see this development of like a chief data officer and, and these types of roles that really are kind of more you know moving right into the c suite now um yeah can you talk a little bit about how that's changed and, and evolved yeah and i think it it really does depend on the company in the area you're in right so i think in general, the profile of data scientists and the impact they're expected to deliver has gone up. And like you said, we have this proliferation of chief data officers. Uh, and actually, even that has morphed. Like, if you look back like six or seven years ago, everybody was talking about the chief data officer. Now people talk about the chief data and analytics officer as being critical or the chief insights officer, or things like that. So I think you know, I think at least in the financial services, what they have gotten a much more senior seat at the table, but they remain, I think, and I personally like this role, but we remain a means to an end. We are driven, and I think rightly driven in the solutions we're developing by our customers or by the business strategy. Whereas I think in some other companies, you know, maybe it's a Palantir or somebody like that, the data scientists are the alpha job family there. And you hear like even in tech firms, the engineers are are much more, or the data scientists are, are much more highly regarded, but they're still second fiddle to a data engineer. Now, whether that will remain that way going forward, I don't know, a lot depends on what those folks deliver. Mm -hmm. But I think in the financial services space, part of the reason it's happened is that there's such a proliferation of data and variety of data that you can't, you have to have data scientists there to help you understand like, is this valuable? Or uh, does this add to our understanding? Does this contradict our understanding? And if you don't have those folks in strategic roles where they can sort of understand why it's important to know whether this is valuable or not, they're not gonna bring the value that you expect. Okay, okay. Yeah. It's interesting, you, you, you talked a couple of times about the financial services industry, right? So, so highly regulated, I would say in many, in many ways, from a technical perspective, often considered laggards, not from a capability perspective, but more from a just a, a wariness, right? Of, mm -hmm. Because the data is so valuable. And, um, but now you have all these insure techs and fintechs that are kind of disrupting the space. So yep. can you talk a little about kind of what that looks like and kind of, you know, sure. what you see kind of down the road um, yep. as that continues to kind of evolve. Yeah. So let me talk first about why that tendency exists within financial services to be conservative, to be wary of some of the change. And I think it, at root, it is that in a risk space, if you are the impact of making a mistake, or shifting to something new and when it's not completely vetted tends to have a longer life than it does say in, you know, in the advertising space. Let's say you deploy a machine learning model uh, for rank ordering, you know, searches or ads uh, buys. If you get it wrong, you can switch it the next day and you it's mm -hmm. you know, a one-time impact. If we deploy a, a model that doesn't properly assess risk, that customer who uses it, whatever they booked in those couple of days between when we found the error, they're stuck with that for potentially 30 years if it's a mortgage. And so, right, you have to, and you see that, like if you go, like, I, I don't think a lot of people do this, but I do sometimes where if you look at like the financial reporting results of financial firms, like during a downturn, you see stuff that they did wrong 
six, seven years ago that is dragging down their P&L, even coming out of a recession. Wow. So that's where, and they also, when you want to implement a new model, there's a lot of governance. Some of it's set by the Fed, Federal Reserve or the other over, or the CFPB, where if you want to build a new model, you have all these rigorous review steps that, you know, it can take you quite a while to get through that approval process. And so there's a cost benefit analysis that, you know, if you got a 0.01% improvement, you know, is it worth the work? Whereas if you got a 0.01% improvement on the Google search platform, it could be worth millions and it wouldn't take that long to implement. Yeah. So that's where, you know, that's where it comes from. That's where that hesitancy comes from. But I also think it it came from a, a point, a perspective of they didn't have competitors. The thought was always, hey, no one could get into this business because the capital requirements are too much or the oversight requirements are too much. And I think the insure tech and the fintechs through like showed that that was just not true. At least, you know, I think they're starting to get as they get scale, they're starting to get a little more attention from regulators. Uh, but they showed that you can do good work with a variety of data that we hadn't traditionally looked at, that you can look at people differently and use data that maybe traditional financial services folks thought wasn't good enough or didn't have enough of an impact. Mm -hmm. um, and so I see like now you see banks introducing things that look a lot like, you know, uh, these unsecured loans that look a lot like I don't know, Lending Club or Prosper, them trying to meet their small business owner partner customers the way a cabbage or others are doing. Yep. And the, in the way I see that playing out in a, as a data scientist is you are now being asked to look at and evaluate so many more types of data and that than you've traditionally been able to use or been allowed to use. And they come from so many different places that you have to start to think not just about, hey, how do I model this? Like you have to learn the basics of the data. Like, does this look like I expect? Like how often, you know, just obvious things that a lot of a lot of traditional folks in the financial services don't think about. Like if you think about what kind of data you get from a credit card issuer, right? It's you get an update once a month when your statement cycles. Yep. Well, if you're talking about like buy now, pay later, they make you pay every two weeks or they could return the, the thing in the middle of it. And so you have to completely change your thinking there and you have to look at your old data differently. Like, why do we use it on a month scale? Why shouldn't we just do it based off the time it arrives? So, and I think that's only going to accelerate as, you know, more types of data come in. Consumers now are getting more control over whether you get their data or not. Uh, so I think like what's going to be big in the, in the future is how do you model data that a customer only lets you get access to for that one transaction, right? So, you know, what the credit reporting agencies and the financial services have is, you know, decades and decades of, of history of data and how people have behaved in different economic environments. But, you know, if you come into a world where, uh, someone says, look, you can go grab my utility payments and my bank accounts and uh, my student loan accounts for this transaction. And then you, you have to delete it, which is, you know, true yep. in, in a lot of places already. Sure. How do you build a model off that? Like, how do you, like, you got to figure out ways to, to work with that data so that you can be sure that for this 30 year mortgage that you're, you're helping somebody figure out what to do with. Do you have enough information to do that? And did the consumer give you the full picture of their credit standing? Yeah, like probably. I, I mean, I wouldn't like if I had a ding on an old credit card. That wouldn't be one of the ones that let you have access to. So right, right. It's interesting. I mean, it seems like the world you're describing from the data science perspective is increasing complexity. You know, so many more different types of data. To me, it seems like that's going to lead to even more specialization inside of the data science world. Like, cause there's just so many different types of, there's no way that one data scientist can understand or, you know, be able to um, manipulate that many different types of models. So it seems like they'll probably be different. I know you already described some pockets, but it seems like more specialization will probably naturally kind of come about. I think so. And I think that that, you know, happened historically, the reason you had statisticians in, 
banks and, and all is because at some point credit modeling moved away from the credit underwriters taking a look at your report and deciding for themselves whether that was good based off rules or not. Mm-hmm. Why, you know, Capital One had data analysts, people that really could handle the huge volume of data that they were used to and organize it in a way that a credit analyst or a statistician could use for their work. And you see that now, I think early on in the data scientist world, people talked about, hey, we need these people that can do it all, that can do almost app development, that know how to play with really messy data, can put a model on it. And you just don't, you don't hear people talking about that now. You talk about, you hear people calling a large group of people data scientists, but you have people that look remarkably like uh, a statistician trained, but they're much more trained in machine learning. You have folks that are really, I don't know, I think some people tried to call them data wranglers for a while, but nobody likes being called a wrangler, I guess. Right. So there are people that are just really good at like digging into data and seeing where the issues are and cleaning that up. And I'll just use my own team as an example of specialization. So we, you know, take in, you get in all these records that have varying degrees of quality of and varying degrees of data about someone's identity. So might have their name and their address, but the next one might have social security number or the last four digits of the social security number. The logic in the rules and the algorithms that are relevant in that space are completely different than anything in any other part of data science in the financial services. Like, and there's like two, maybe one or two programs in the entire country that train people specifically in this field. And so that was part of why I wanted to get into this was because like I had never worked in this space. I wanted to learn what it was like. And I think you're going to see that like you already, like we already see that and I've talked to people at other firms where they are in financial services and they're building, you know, they're moving to the cloud. So they said, okay, well, we got to bring in people from like Google or Amazon who are used to the cloud and know how to work with it. But those guys, those folks that came in, they were really good with the tools, but they didn't understand the, the risk model or yeah. they would get frustrated. Well, why can't you build a new model tomorrow? I was like, well, we got these seven people who have to approve it and they would get frustrated as like, well, why do you have to do that? And like, you know, so that's kind of what I, I think you're right. You are going to see more specialization. It may be field driven. It'll probably be data driven. And I think uh, when I was at a strata conference, you know, seven or eight years ago, you were seeing the beginnings of that, where if you looked at what the academic researchers and machine learning and AI were saying, it was like, you need that expert input to make your AI models or your machine learning models appropriate. Like they were talking in their case about like uh, categorizing articles about uh, particular animals. And they were, when they built it on their own the first time, they were like getting really bizarre results because they didn't know that a term for like the, I don't even remember what it was. Like there was a specific term for the tail of a beaver or something that you had to use. And so they had to go back and and get those experts to help them do that. Now in the business world, it's not quite like that, but you need people that understand, hey, where is this going to go wrong? And what do I need to look up? So yeah, it's a good point. I'm just thinking about kind of, we have, we, in our community, we have a lot of kind of uh, folks that are recent graduates or looking for um, career shifts. And so you know, you've got a long kind of, you know, um, you've got a really, had a really kind of uh, established career here in data science. What are some of the, you know, some, some advice or some best practices that you would, you know, you would kind of hand over to them? Sure. So uh, on the one, one thing, and this is something that I always tell new college hires is find what you really like to do, regardless of where, and it, it, that will change at different points in your career. But if you really like doing a particular type of work, even if it's not the most glamorous job in the world, like go do that. Because if you're, if you like doing something, you'll be better at it. And you also, you don't know what's going to be important in five to 10 years. When I started out at Capital One, the data analysts were the sort of afterthought of the job families. They were, you know, important, but we were definitely like, four or five levels down on the hierarchy of who was the most critical to the company. But like now it's not flipped at a bank, but their, their role is so much more prominent. They have so much more there that I think finding what you like to do and really trying to make a career out of that makes a big difference, but also, you know, 
The second thing I would say is don't be afraid to shift. Like if you're bored by what you're doing, try something new Like yep. go somewhere else. And then I think like my last advice is, and this came from my thesis advisor when I was a, a graduate student and I was, you know, we were doing uh, analysis, trying to find these very weak signals from stars and galaxies and in a, in a huge amount of noise. And so we had to use in standard parlance, we had to be four standard deviations above the mean for us to think about, about publishing it. And I was like, why is that? That's like the chance of that being wrong is like 0.000, I don't know what it was, 1%. Like, why do we have to have such a high standard? And he said, the thing that stuck with me is like extraordinary results require extraordinary proof because no one was expecting our results to, to um, match, to, to occur the way that was happening. And so what I, what I often find with junior analysts is, and what I advise them on is be suspicious of results that you think are like no one's had before. Like go back, look at it, make sure that you like try to test it and make sure your logic is correct. And I think that saves you a lot of, it's okay to, sh to make mistakes, but like you don't want it to happen because of hubris, right? That like, right. Oh, of course these guys aren't that smart or whatever, I, I figured it out. Right. Right. I'll just tell you one story real quick of like a, of an example. So when I worked on the, as a postdoc, we had a telescope that was about 33 feet across. You always had to keep it um, pointed down during the day because we always showed on these tours that somebody, when it was being built, put a, an iron plate about that, about that thick, right at the center of the focal point of the, of the mirror, burned through it in like 30 seconds because it's focusing all this light. Well, we had a, a visiting scientist who was supposed to develop a filter for us to use in the night, but in li like lighter time periods. And he came running out of his lab office one day saying, hey, uh, I, we can run in the sun. We can operate with the sun up because he thought he figured out this filter. And then a couple minutes later, after talking to the senior leader, he left the room and sort of dejected, went home. We sort of leaned out of our offices to look at the the professor and he said he made a small factor error of a factor of a million in his calculations that that made it wrong so <laughs> you know so that's that was a, the three pieces Absolutely. of advice right do what yeah. you love change when you don't like it anymore and be suspicious of extraordinary results so. i think that's great i think that's uh that's all great advice so so one more question to close with and you know one of the things about um the data standard is we're always trying to figure out how to enable and accelerate kind of the path to ai and ml like mm -hmm. that's what everyone kind of gets really excited about in this community yep. and if you look today you know if you look at kind of like the the latest like mckinsey study you know they'll say that 80 percent of you know ai and ml initiatives fail so my question to you is what are the biggest impediments to, you know, enabling AI and ML? You know, is it people? Is it organization? Is it the quality of the data? Is it a combination? Um, you know, and again, I, this is a very general question, but what, what do you see as kind of the biggest barriers? Well, that's a good question. So what I see in my space, and it may be different in other areas, is uh, twofold. One is, is this problem actually something that AI and ML should solve right that like we badly formed problems where is this really something that ai and ml would make a big difference on? because it's a lot of work right like building an mm -hmm. ai and ml model at least in the risk space is a big investment of time you don't have you're using expensive people typically to do that work the other is the people that are building the models don't always have a good partner to tell them whether it's actually addressing the problem. Like mm -hmm. it's easy to get lost in the, the learning and come up with, you know, what the behavioral economists would say is a replacement problem. Like the real problem you're trying to solve is X. I don't know how to make my, train my model to do that. I'll do this one that sounds similar, but is actually easier to do. And it solves so, Y. Or... <laughs> yeah, and it solves Y, and which isn't what they originally wanted. So yeah. there's, I'm sure there's resistance from senior leaders to deploy. Sometimes customers don't actually, like they say they want it, but when they see what's involved, they, they don't. But in my space, it's poorly formed problems and things where machine learning isn't really the answer. So. Got it. Well, 
Mike Cantonese, uh, Vice President, Statistical Analytics and Data Science at Equifax. Uh, thank you so much for the time. We really appreciate you just kind of contributing to the data standard. And I know that a lot of listeners are going to really appreciate your insights. If anyone wants to reach out to you, uh, is the best way to kind of connect over LinkedIn or, or how would you suggest yeah, that? LinkedIn would be great. And okay. I'd be happy to chat. So thanks again, Mike. We appreciate thank it. Thank you. That was a real pleasure. 